You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 327 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, today joined by uh, master woodworker Seth Miller and uh, his his sidekick, Fosma Moon. <laughs> How did I become a sidekick? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what the hell just happened? <laughs> Take two. Uh, <laughs> And even if we didn't take two, you're not leaving it. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's worth leaving it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I will say you did get me out of the basement wood shop to come up to my attic office and record. So that that is true today. We're recording it on Saturday. So it sounds like something like record. serial killers say. <laughs> you got me out of the basement. <laughs> so now, is your attic cold in the winters? Like it's super hot in the summers, or is it moderate? Uh, it does get cold. It depends on how much sun we get. And sort of, you know, how much the roof heats up to heat it. But it does get cold. It's got heat in it. Uh, there's a baseboard heat electric on one wall that I have my desk relatively close to. So, As as someone who very frequently watches this old house, you, your house sounds like a great candidate. <laughs> there, You know, it's got it's got some funky little nuance and, you know, definitely the old touch is still part of it. And then clearly, like, there's an addition that is new construction that is way worse quality than the original. Hmm. Um, which... In some ways, isn't that surprising? When was uh, the when was the addition added? Early two thousands. Oh, interesting. Okay. And apparently, the guy involved was the contractor was a mess, um, and like it was awful on our house, but got it done, and then like started at the neighbors down the road, and like got thrown off that project eventually halfway through because it was such a disaster. Now, all well <laughs> before we got here. But on that note, and very briefly, our neighbors across the street uh, and our next door are, are uh, getting some renovations done. Like they had a house that was a two was split into two and was two rentals, and they threw out both tenants or let the leases expire and are sort of recombining it into a single family house and are moving back in. And so sort of gut renovation, huge project. They've been going at it for months now, but massive drama. Uh, I think it was Thursday, like one of the contractors, the electrical guy was pacing up and down the side street, screaming at the top of his lungs so loud that I could hear him clearly sitting at my desk upstairs inside with the storm windows closed <laughs> um, about how the prime contractor, the GC had taken money and told the how like told the owners that he was paying the electricians, but only paid him half and had stolen his money and like threatening lawsuits and how we were never going to work together. And he was going to come down there and kick his ass and all this stuff. And it was just like great drama, great entertainment. I stopped work for 15 minutes and just watched this guy pacing up and down the street screaming. It was really quite fun for 15 minutes. Did you, did you feel like you were back in Manhattan? A little bit. <laughs> I, I mean, just, I mean, listen, managing contractors and whatnot always sucks, but I had similar problems when I had my, my house redone and my apartment redone in Manhattan. Yeah. We had to, I had to track down a contractor and find the money that was missing and all those same things. So yeah, it brought me back. It was great. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, we got a lot of topics this week. So let's just start with uh, British Airways baby bus. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for yeah. flying. Bye bye. Bye bye. So their last, I mean, they they suspended the route right, London City JFK, back when COVID started. Well, they, uh, tri- they trimmed it even before that, right? Couple, yeah, yeah, like twenty sixteen ish. They trimmed it to single flights, a single daily or whatever. They right, they got rid of. Bravo, the second plane, yep. and kept the first one. So that was the first cut. But it was, you know, it was still running. I took it. I had to go back and look. I took it in 2017, and it was down to one a day at that point, but it was still flying. And and now COVID kind of cut that, right? Even yeah, they more. halted. They suspended flights in March last year, mm-hmm. and in August sort of announced, no, we're just not going to bring it back. And then this week finally made good on that by sending the plane off to be scrapped. So, I mean, is it is this route dead, like permanently, you think? Or is this like one of those A220 routes that we could we could see happen? If it happens again, it will be an A220 route. And that's, you know, when it, when the C-Series, before it was an A220, when the C-Series was, you know, still marketing and doing its thing, I think it was after one of the, it was either after one of the air shows in Farnborough or Paris or just for funsies one day when they had done a tour over to Europe, they actually brought it in, they brought the 100 series, the C-Series 100 into uh, City. Landed, you know, did taxi tests and whatever, and then loaded it, waited as though it had 40 business class seats on board, and flew nonstop to JFK. Without the stop in Shannon. 
without the stop in Shannon. So that's that's actually one of the big deals uh, that the A220 slash C series brought to the table is it could actually get off the ground at City with a quote unquote full full business only payload mm-hmm. and make the full crossing, whereas the 318 could get off the ground but not full not with enough fuel to make the trip. I mean, I, I, how do you guys feel about that? I mean, Fuzz, I mean, you liked the pre-clearance, right? Like going to Shannon and, and clearing immigration there and then landing in JFK as a domestic flight. I, I, I like the thought of it, but the, the one time that I did that flight, it was the late flight, so there was no pre-clearance. Oh, so you still landed at JFK as an international flight? Yeah, and it was crazy because, <laughs> you know, T7 in JFK, it's got those caverns downstairs, just those narrow hallways. And you basically, as you got off the jet bridge, and this was like one of the last gates in the corner. You just came to a screeching halt because a Cathay flight had just come in. Oh, yeah. So I mean, the line was super long, and I'm and I just sat there. I'm like, there has to. I like. I'm like, this can't be for global entry. So I just like walked all the way down and literally through all these caverns, and eventually you get to the front. And sure enough, that's a regular line. Yeah, wow. I was gonna say the, the big problem with T seven, especially there, is you can't if you if you are stay at the back, you'll never realize that there's no line at global entry. Yeah. Yeah, you'll sit in the line and wait and wait and wait, and then you get to the front, you'll be like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, that's the one nice thing. I'm like, you know what? I, the way I looked at it, I'm like, worst case, I have to go back to the end. There's 32 people on this flight. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I've come in. Maybe I came in at T7. No, that would have been T4, I think, right, for Lufthansa? One. T1. T1, okay. Yeah, I, I came in there for, I think, Swiss. Maybe I came into T7. I can't remember. No, that would that be was for you. Yeah. Okay. It, it would really only be Cathay. Uh, ANA back in the day. ANA back in the day and uh, BA mm. and IP area. And so when I came in on Cathay, we landed at uh, T8, where we came into T8 because they were yeah. using America's That's terminal. Then. More recent. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it's I, I'm to me like the 220 makes a ton of sense, right? Even if I come in as an international flight, um, if it's a nonstop, I don't have to stop in Shannon, get off the plane. That's that whole rigmarole seemed like a kind of a pain. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, the the question really becomes how much demand is there for people willing to pay, you know, the business class fare, even if it's a discounted business class fare because the corporate contracts and whatever, on the regular for flights between London and New York, and mm-hmm. specifically from the Docklands slash, you know, Canary Wharf financial district. I mean, I would go so far as to say, like, if the demand is there, right, there's no reason they couldn't do preclearance for 32 people in London City. Where? Like in the, in the, in the I guess, departure area? Yeah. Just as you're going into that little waiting room, right? Yeah. It's 32. I mean, yeah. You, you'd basically – well, it would depend on what the U.S. government is willing to accept as facilities. True. That's really what it comes down to, right? If you – so there's an interesting sort of side story to this is the government of the Bahamas has been trying to set up preclearance in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Um and actually, you know, it was ready to go. They turned it on. They sort of turned it on on an ad hoc basis with one or two airlines just before uh, when one of the hurricanes came through, I guess, in 2019 because recovery efforts. Basically, you had uh, seaplane pilots flying recovery missions, but they had to go to Nassau or Freeport and clear immigration every time and then get out to where they were supposed to be. And they got stuck in, you know, air traffic at Freeport and Nassau because systems were damaged, capacity was lessened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They finally convinced the uh, Bahamian government to basically put someone in, uh, I think they did it at Fort Lauderdale to start. They basically had a guy sit there and be like, okay, these are the people on the flight, check the passports, blah, 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 you guys are good to go. And it wasn't like a U.S. preclearance where then you are isolated and cordoned off and this and that. But like with U.S. preclearance or U.S. immigration, there's often significant other stuff behind the scenes like secondary secondary interrogation rooms and holding cells and USDA customs inspection facilities and all sorts of crap like that. Mm-hmm. If you if they're going to do it at city, that's that you like you would need way more space to put all those other things. Uh, but I don't know how much of that is only really required in the U.S. stations. Like I just I remember doing the tour when they built the T five international arrivals for at JFK for JetBlue, and like there's a jail cell, mm-hmm. like heavily reinforced jail cell and courtroom down there if they have to do a hearing without letting the person technically pass the gates to enter the U.S. <laughs> I mean, I think about the old Ireland, right? It was tiny. It was just that one area. You like, you went to the end of the concourse, you went downstairs, and then you were there. In Dublin or Shannon? Dublin. Yeah, but the new version of it is like you go downstairs, and there's like they built a second pier. Yeah, right. Exactly. There's a whole. And, and I don't put it. And again, though, like I've been through that a couple of times. I don't know what's sort of behind that wall, as it were, in the private space. Is there? Do all these extra facilities exist? That's the only. And then I guess we'll find out soon enough, right? There's talk about Amsterdam getting one. There's talk about a couple other. Off and on over the years, we've been ta- hearing that other countries are going to get preclearance. I just, I w- on the one hand, I would be surprised uh, from a facilities perspective. You also have to negotiate with the government about 
you know, are the U.S. officers allowed to carry a firearm and mm-hmm. things like that, that some countries take uh, stronger objections to than others. But I don't know. I, I'm a lot of people are sad that this flight is disappearing. I the one time I did it was relatively unimpressed. Yeah, I mean, I've done it both ways. Uh, westbound and eastbound, and yeah, there's nothing really exciting about it. The best, I mean, the most appealing part was going to London. Yeah, you, you're in the city, and you've, they've got that nice welcome service where they'll get you a room at the uh, Radisson, hmm. and you can go get cleaned up and stuff before you hit the ground running. So it was nice in that you, you know you get off the plane, 15, there's a car waiting for you. You go over to the hotel. Was that and, still in place as late as 2017? I don't think I got that. Uh, maybe. It's like, I right. I mean, they also like you used to get Concord room access at JFK, and you didn't anymore. They definitely well, scaled back some of the services. When when I did that, I did not get Concord room access. I okay. do know that. I, I also technically was on a connecting flight, but I can't remember if I had an overnight or not. So that may have skewed my experience. So I mean, I guess that's like one question I have. Like that that was actually like a nice feature, right? Of uh, it's a nice feature of Heathrow is that you you know arrivals lounges are pretty prevalent in Heathrow. Um, so you could get a shower, you know, get cleaned up, have some breakfast, and then head into town. But I mean, if they were offering hotel rooms, uh, that's just as good. I don't need breakfast. I could, you know, find something at a you know coffee shop near near my office or whatever. Well, you actually got call a business first service, and you'd be fine. You actually got you actually got breakfast in the restaurant as well. Oh, see, so yeah, I mean, they took care of everything. I'm trying to see when I last did it. Yeah, and I'm I'm not too broken up about losing it. Is I guess what I'm saying. I did in April 2017. And it I was guess like, you did it just before me. I did it in June. I assume we were on the same mistake fair. Probably. <laughs> I think it was to Geneva or Paris or something like that. Geneva? Maybe? I think it was a Geneva fair, and I took it to go to the Paris Air Show and just took the train across, or was planning to take the train across, and then they canceled, or when I did, they canceled the flight one day, or, and I think, or they canceled like the Geneva flight the day I was scheduled on. I was like, oh, um, just send me to Paris instead, and it'll be fine, and I think I'd, I just cheated that, but... <laughs> All I know is I went to Hamburg afterwards. Anyway, it's gone. She's dead, Jim. So an, another another topic that, that is, I think, fascinating is that de Havilland has paused production. So the maker of the Dash 8 has kind of put the brakes on. Um, what do you guys think At least think they're going to finish the existing order book? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess that's a plus for airlines that are waiting for them. Yeah, I'm not sure how big the order book is, which is part of the challenge. But. Is that a plus or a negative, right? How many airlines actually want new planes right now? That's true. You know, Q400's been pretty popular. I don't know. Do you, do you think, uh, I mean, because are they stopping production on everything or just the Dash 8? Let's, uh, just the Dash 8. Um, and it's, the interesting part about that is it's also tied to the manufacturing facility. It's in downtown, or in Downsview, Toronto area. Mm-hmm. And so Bombardier, I, this was like a line that came as part of Bombardier and they, or something like that, and they sold the facility, um, but, uh, yeah, it was sold by Bombardier in 2018, and there was a lease associated, like, to allow them to get out, and the lease ends this year. So that's part of the challenge also is, like, they got to move the whole assembly line and figure out where to restart it. So it's not just, like, a Boeing shutdown where you can pause the line and pick it all back up right where it was. Uh, if they pick this back up, they actually have to move the whole thing. Oh, my gosh. That's, I mean, that's a huge pain. Yeah. Jeez. Um, I mean, because, like, I was just thinking, like, they make the Twin Otter. They make, they make some other planes right and I, I was wondering how much those are impacted because that's you know, a lot of that's like used for bush pilots or things out west and yeah i think those are actually manufactured for the west also okay okay um united and archer are talking about uh, an electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft uh and i am color me unimpressed by this because i i don't see it in the near future maybe in the long-term future you don't think the technology will work or you don't think people will care I don't think it's there's enough of a selling point. Like I don't think there's enough of a market. Like right, and I also think that the complications of getting in a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft uh, in and out of cities that aren't New York is more difficult than people think. But the, but the helicopter service worked out so well. Yeah, yeah, that didn't go anywhere. You know, uh, I mean, did helicopter services fail because they were too expensive, or because they, you know, from time to time would crash and kill people? They were included in the first fares. No, that's right. They were free for anyone you know, on a paid first ticket. In and out of New York City area, yeah. Yeah. And it's still filled. Yeah. I wish I had, I wish I had gotten to take one of those. I mean, that was a long time ago. It was like, what, uh, 2010, 2012? Yeah, something like that. 2009, 2010. And I do wish I had done it, but it is what it is. Yeah. 
I, I mean, I don't know, Seth. I, th- I feel like it's a great concept, right? Like the idea of you know, getting from a downtown area to the airport in five minutes is cool. Um, but like, I can't see Portland allowing helicopters downtown in an area where I would want to go. <laughs> what, what, United is not, what United is not telling you is this is going to be the return to JFK. They're just going to fly you to Newark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's our shuttle service. Skip the traffic. Well, you know, back in the 80s, Pan Am used to do that from Newark to JFK. Pan Am they used had a helicopter hop across or an airplane hop? Helicopter. They actually had a, cho- a chopper service that would go from Newark to JFK. And then you get on the plane to JFK and fly on? Yep. I didn't know that. Um, maybe, I did get to take the U.S. helicopter service back in 06, 07, whenever that was running. Um, it was cool. I agree. Um, but... So I think part of it is discussion about, like, that was a couple helicopters that ran, like, once or twice an hour, and your schedule really had to line up. Um, And I made it work because I would work downtown right on Mall Street at a customer until, like, 5.30, catch the 6.05 helicopter, and then the 7.30 flight to Orlando. And Mm. so, like, it just so happened that everything lined up. If the flight was at 8 or at 7, even worse, like, I could take a longer layover, but if the flight was at 7, like, it wouldn't have worked. Um, or I would have had to take the one an hour earlier and I would have lost the work time and it would would have been a mess. So like the, one of the ideas behind this is that, (coughs) excuse me, it's a lot more frequent service. Um, and that's partly reflected in the theoretical number of these planes that will be, um, or not planes, flying taxis that will be involved. Um, I am skeptical. There's also like the, someone was saying in a conversation I was having about this is like, this is going to induce travel. Once this happens, people will start flying more. I'm it's sorry. Like, it's not. It's not what keeps me out of the airport. It's <laughs> really, what? The ta- yeah, right. The, ta- the commute to the airport is why you didn't go to Tokyo this week for work. <laughs> and when I suggested that as the res- as my you know response to that, the guy was like, and just moved on. Not surprisingly, it was someone who like worked for whatever Uber's old flying thing was. Uber, so like yeah, Uber Copter drink, or whatever. It was. Yeah, drinking the Kool Aid and convinced that this is this is ju- it's just this one thing, and once it happens, we'll be all set. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think part of the challenge is or. The head, the sort of lead headlines is United commits to buy, you know, is going to buy 200 of these and investing a huge amount of money. And the reality is United's uh, investment was very, very little upfront cash. It's, it's warrants. Um, and I think as Henry Hardeveld said, uh, this buys that this what this buys Archer is a guaranteed sales call. Like someone will take your call when you actually have product to sell. Someone at United will actually let you in the door to talk about it. <laughs> As opposed to being like, are you kidding me? Ha, ah, and hanging up the phone on you. Or not responding to your email, whatever the you know, equivalent I mean, it, is, five years it, hence. It could be a useful replacement for things like the Allentown bus or going back to things like uh, Ellington or Hobby. True, true. But it only holds, what, four passengers or something, right, Seth? But, yeah, the, the model they're talking about is four passengers plus a pilot. But the Allentown bus holds, what, 12 people. If you can do three of these an hour, right, you can just stagger the people. That's true, that's true. Yeah, no, I mean, I, but again, like... In the, and that's probably right at the edge of distance, too, right? How far is... 60 well, miles. Yeah, that's right at the edge of the distance. So, um, and I think of the range that they're talking about. So would it be able to do round trip or would you need battery cells at both ends? Like, there's some really interesting questions about, you know, scaling this up to something that's actually useful. And then also, in my mind, someone suggested like, oh, well, you know, this is, you know, creating, uh, you know, democratizing travel and, blo- and making it easier for everybody. And I'm like, there's nothing about this that is democratization. Democratization of travel is building transit, like yeah. public transit systems that are low cost and more efficient. Because I, I have a feeling like even if this, you know, is available, it's not going to be super cheap, uh, you know, uh, or at a level where like everyone can afford it. Like I even like I consider taking the helicopter from downtown uh, Manhattan to Newark. Um, and just buying it outright because I think they were offering like some like uh, it was Blade or something like that offering like one hundred and ten dollars for the one way and I'm like that's a lot of money to f- for a six minute flight um, and I can't imagine other people going yeah let's do that <laughs> like it's, it's it's worth it once for the the yucks I mean that's I think I paid when I did it it was ninety nine mm-hmm. um, but I also was I I got it because I was traveling for work our car service was seventy five so I only actually had to pay the twenty five out of pocket and that, and that's kind of what I was thinking I was going to do and then I just I you know I just and then COVID happened so <laughs> and you've got to have an accounting department that's willing to understand no listen I know that the receipt says one hundred and ten dollars on it but I only put it in for thirty five because normally it's in like or I only put it in for seventy because that's normally what the car is and I'm paying the other out of pocket and blah blah like yeah exactly I worked at a small company where that was possible yeah and I mean it would have been it would have been great for me because our office was literally I could see the hell port from yeah. our office so i was like i could walk there in five minutes um and i, I just never did it. i wish i would have but like i just i don't i agree i don't think this is democratization of, of travel like democratization of travel is you know 
like you said, public transit that's affordable. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, one of the big parts of the press release was about like, oh, it's going to be more efficient transit, right? Like, because it's fully electric. And then you look at the airport, you know, United Airlines, by the time this is ready to fly, LAX is going to have electrified rail service, mass mm-hmm. transit. San Francisco already has it. Newark already has it. Or um, uh, what are the other hubs? Houston, not really. Chicago has it. Uh, Denver sort of has it. Like when you start looking at the the hub operations and where this could happen, Dulles will have it by then because the Silver Line will have extended. So it's like this actually doesn't make things lower emission. This is a less efficient use of electricity on a per user you know per seat basis. And and to re- and to remind everybody, batteries, uh, lithium ion or any any kind of battery really is usually a, a, a big user of heavy metals and non renewable items <laughs> from the, the earth. So. I mean, the mining of lithium alone is such a <laughs> treacherous treacherous process, right? It leaves entire wastelands out there that look like. There's an article I read, I think maybe in the Guardian or something last year. They, there's a place in China where they just mine lithium and it literally looks like something out of Mad Max. <laughs> Shit. Like black water. I mean, it just looks awful. But hey, it's efficient, right? I mean, it's efficient. Batteries are efficient. <laughs> sure, but where's the electricity coming from? I, I know, I know. These are the ethical dilemmas. Another part of it is like, oh, well, if you use renewable... This is actually, it's funny, is uh, boom, Supersonic has had a similar sort of position. Like, we're going to run on 100% sustainable fuel. Okay, well, it's, you're recycling the raw materials to make it, but there's still the electricity component to build, to generate the fuel. Um Oh, well, we're going to use fully renewable resources, you know, only solar or hydro or wind for, to generate that electricity. Okay, but, like, what about the other people, like, the other resources that could also use that electricity? Like, you can you can easily take it both directions of, um, do you actually, like, is this more efficient or is this coming up with a vaguely efficient way to just burn stuff? Yeah. Like, burn resources for fun where it's not really needed. And that can obviously extend all the way down to, like, do I need to go on this work trip tomorrow kind of discussions, but I mean, I know I'm a hypocrite because I go on my children. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, but it's not like you didn't, you do overnight trips, Houston to Cancun. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, so Ted Cruz, <laughs> Mr. Ted Cruz decided, uh, uh, he wanted to take an overnight trip, uh, to, I mean, I think he was going to stay longer for the overnight, yeah, he was. <laughs> uh, and it turned into an overnight after some outrage. Uh, but he, he basically got a nice little Houston Cancun mile run out of it. A nice 946 mile, mile run. And he didn't even get upgraded on the way back, poor guy. I think got, I got upgraded on the way down either. <laughs> oh, um, so American and JetBlue have announced uh, some some code share routes. Is that is that right? And like some joint schedules. Like what is what is all this? So the I mean they announced the Northeast Alliance last summer, and it was basically coordinating schedules at JFK, LaGuardia, Newark, and Boston, and. It's there's supposed to be some frequent flyer reciprocity, but we don't know what it is yet. There's going to be some other stuff, maybe eventually, like slot swaps of JetBlue using American slots to up its service levels. Um, JetBlue's talking about maybe fifty or sixty flights a day at LaGuardia. Wow, up from their current like twenty, and that only comes if they can get these slots from American because you know there's no other way to get slots at LaGuardia that are affordable. Um, I mean, hell, um, Delta and WestJet called off their joint venture because they were going because the DOT was going to make them sell eight of the slots, and that just wasn't acceptable. So they just called off the joint venture completely. And this isn't even a joint venture, right? They can't coordinate pricing. There's some other things that they can't do, uh, but scheduling. And so last week they finally released some of the first routes where there is going to be code share operations. And I got to say, the rollout was sloppy. Um, figuring out what routes are covered in each direction has been super challenging. Um, I finally got into it a little bit and was able to get some data from one of the schedule systems. And I think it's about, tw- I'm looking now, there's JetBlue code on American Metal. There's 24 routes out of Boston, JFK, or LaGuardia, and it's relatively evenly distributed. Um, Boston smallest, JFK next, and then LaGuardia is the biggest. And then, in like LaGuardia, Miami, you can now buy a JetBlue coded ticket on American Metal. Um, <laughs> but... There's also, like, it's not fully uh, reciprocal, so there's some markets that both airlines fly, and they're, like, they, they announced somewhere they're going to coordinate their schedules, right? It's, like, they talked about, we're going to take, actually, like, the New York City to South Florida market, and so that's all three New York City airports to the three main uh, South Florida markets of Miami, Palm Beach, and Fort Lauderdale, combined 47 daily flights when the service fully takes effect. Um, between D.C. and Boston, JetBlue will offer four and American will offer seven. Um, Boston to South Florida, JetBlue will offer 14 and American will offer eight. Um, 
New York to L.A., which is an interesting one, combined 14 daily flights. But that includes uh, Newark from JetBlue, as well as then the uh, JFK service. And so American is going to have six daily flights. JetBlue is going to have eight. If I think right now JetBlue is at three or four out of Newark. So maybe it'll be six from JFK on American and four from JFK on JetBlue. Huh. Um, and they're calling it hourly service, but it's not all from the same airport. So that's a little awkward. Um, you know, th- there's... It's an interesting collection of sort of where they're trying to coordinate things, and I certainly get what they're um, going for. Um, Boston, L.A., Boston, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, Raleigh. Seeing some of the hub-to-hub kind of stuff, uh, like New York to Dallas, New York to Chicago coordination that are, in theory, American hub-to-hub routes, sort of outsourcing slash shifting some of that to code share on JetBlue is super interesting to me, but... Well, and, the, and the odd one during the announcements was the JFK Orange County. Yes, American. So then there's the other routes being added. And that's not a code share flight. But, you know, a big part of this is that both airlines said, if you know this gets approved, we're going to add new service. And so uh, LaGuardia to Charleston and LaGuardia to Denver on JetBlue Metal um, are two interesting ones on that side. Uh, Denver's actually going to be double daily. And that's a market that uh, has historically been red eye only for JetBlue. So finally some daytime flights there. Um, and then... Uh, but JFK to Orange County will become year-round service on American. Um, Boston to Columbus, Ohio, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Some of the, a lot of these are seasonal. Um, tr- and the Orange County one is the premium transcon. Yeah, that's gonna be, it's, it's the three eight three twenty one T. So that's the three cabin fancy ex- fancy plane. Ex- explain to me the logic in that though. Like, is there's, Orange- there's there's a lot of money in Orange County. Uh-huh. So back back in the Continental days, I remember talking to a station manager at Orange County, and he told me that the Newark flights only needed like a fifteen percent load factor to be profitable. People would pay full fare F. Yeah, you couldn't. Yeah, that, that, you couldn't buy F seats on that route for get yeah, upgrades. Exactly. Um, Crazy. Yeah, what, right. United had a had a or uh, Continental three. had a club in Orange County, didn't it? No, no. Or United did. United did, but they had three flights a day, right? Um, with the morning and afternoon and the red eye, and they were all. Oh, the first cabin was always sold out weeks in advance, generally. And the three twenty one T can do that. Well, I guess. I mean, you can take a seven five can take off from there. Hmm. I was so, just thinking more like weight and stuff. Well, seven five is comparable to a three twenty one right? I mean, three twenty one T has fewer seats in it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. And and so, I guess Seth, my question for you about all this is: is is this like American signaling they want a merger with JetBlue? Well, you know, and I think everybody in the industry call is calling it a pseudo merger of sorts. There's a similar thing, ha- right? There's the similar thing happening with Alaska Airlines out west. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not that JetBlue's special um, necessarily, or they're, they're equally special to Alaska Airlines. Um, but also, I think this is sort of a not half ass, but it's a it's a first step, and it's something that could actually get approved. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some pushback on the approval. That's the other interesting part about it is even on the day that they announced all these new routes. Um, Southwest Airlines filed another brief in its ongoing effort to get the approval reconsidered or revoked or at least require more slot divestitures, right? Like the the total, they have to, the two carriers have to divest, I think, six, seven slots at JFK and six at DCA. And that's it to be able to allow to collude on scheduling mm-hmm. um, at JFK and LaGuardia and Newark and Logan, all of which are very limited access airports. So the airlines and consumer uh, travel uh, organizations, whatever, um, are definitely opposed to letting this happen. And like rightfully point out, the only reason JetBlue has all these slots is because they were an independent competitor and they got them, you know, when American and U.S. merged, they got them as sort of relief slots that, that were required to be divested. That's the same argument can be made of why Delta had to, in WestJet, they, the DOT wanted them to give back those eight slots for that joint venture, except the DOT decided that nothing had to happen at LaGuardia. It only had to happen at DCA, which is bizarre to me. I mean, it's because where that's where um, combined they are bigger. Where you know, right, where Delta and Western combined were much bigger at Laguardia. But hmm. it's still a super interesting situation. I I'm skeptical that there really will be a reconsideration by the DOT, but some people seem to think it's going to happen. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, crazy. I I don't even know what to say. It's just wild. I never thought I'd see the day that uh, JetBlue and American were. Trading schedules. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually, I'm just looking through the list here. You can actually now get JetBlue flight numbers on Americans' JFK LA flights, but not the other way around. And again, the asymmetry. And, and I'm sure that eventually it will all get lined up. Um, but like, even on the day they announced it, 
uh, they were like, the tickets are on sale now, and you couldn't you couldn't buy them. Uh, it took like American <laughs> initially released only the Ember one ninety flights were loaded, not any of the three twenties or three twenty ones. And they called it an M90 instead of an E90 for some reason. So it was showing up as an MD90 in their website. It was awesome. Um, eventually that got sorted out. I assume someone saw my tweet and fixed it. But <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a bad host. I was going to say, we, we actually were talking about preclearance. And there's a, we have a topic from a listener uh, on Amtrak preclearance in Montreal. Oh, that's right. And I did a terrible job. So I think it's Ben. Uh, I apologize. We yeah. completely dropped the ball on that one. Let's talk about that real quick. Like Amtrak is wanting to have a preclearance facility in Montreal, right? I'm not sure if want is the right statement, but I think there's talk about could that make more sense than stopping the train at the border and doing clearance there, certainly. And the train doesn't make any extra stops in Canada, so why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be awesome, I think, you know, connecting New York State and Montreal with, with a you know, preclearance before you get on the train or something would be, uh, would be a, great exp- a great user experience. Yeah, I, I mean, it would be even better if they actually could make the trains run quickly. But <laughs> Details. Um. It's like a 12-hour train ride from Montreal to New York. Yeah. It's crazy. Where does it stop? Like, all these, like, random little towns. It also runs 65 or, like, 80 miles an hour at most, I think. Yeah, but it's, it's like being in a car. But it's like a seven-hour drive. It's not even that long of a drive. <laughs> hey. I, I just remember when I was looking, I think that it's also, like, they have to stop long enough to clear everybody at the immigration counter at the checkpoints. But, like, when I did the, uh, when I went up for the C-Series 300 first flight, it was in Montreal, and I was trying to figure out my schedule to get back, and the fl- I was buying it last minute, and sh- things were crazy expensive, and my schedule was super confusing. I was looking at all my options, and that was one of them. If I leave my house now, it's a six-hour and 12-minute drive. <laughs> so you could go round trip before the train could get there? Yes. <laughs> Just what do you do? Go all the way up to Erie and then come back? I don't know. I, I I had a coworker that was doing. He drove from Providence to Montreal every week when we were going there. And yeah, uh, stupid. Yeah, and I mean, it, that is not a choice I would generally make. Well, and no, it's, there's no good way to do it. Exactly. Like him from him flying from Providence, he'd have to go down to New York or up to Boston. And by that time he did that, it connect and it would take him about the same amount of time. <laughs> yeah, this is like when I drove to New York or Newark. Yeah, a couple weeks yeah, ago. Yeah. Um, United is uh, looking to retaliate, I guess, against JetBlue's uh, non-existent flight. Which is Boston to London Heathrow. Hey man, it's gonna happen. Well, and I and I love in the press release of this from United that we we haven't determined a start date yet, but we're waiting for JetBlue to tell us ours. It's really the underpinning <laughs> to tone here. <laughs> I mean, there's probably some fa- part of that might actually be the current landscape that they don't know when a good time would be. Like true, a- true. AA still claims they're gonna start flying Seattle Heathrow on March 27th, which doesn't seem realistic. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. I mean, it's a, it's. I, I just think it's weird. So this pl- it's going to be operated by a high uh, business class config seven sixty seven. Um, they're going to have enough. Yeah, that's great uh, for you. It's perfect, right? Uh, but I'm it's an op up or fly flat coach, one or the other, <laughs> or that two uh, the two or the two uh, window seat. Any of those are fine with me. Exactly, exactly, and so, which also comes with. I think it comes with uh, premium economy as well. Yeah. It does. Um, and so, and it's going to be a night departure, an evening departure from London Heathrow, which is also really nice. Um, so it's a 10 p.m. departure from Boston. So get on board, fall asleep, wake up in London. So I mean, obviously, it's a little bit of a later arrival, not as useful for early business meetings, but I don't do business, so whatever. Um, it's all about me, just in case you weren't. Uh, <laughs> and then on the return, it's 5 p.m. out of Heathrow gets to Boston at 7.30, which is a little late for me to get finally home, but... It's, you know, you get that full extra day in yeah. Europe. It's kind of nice. It's And that's a lot. Or you, if you're coming somewhere else from the continent, right? You can take an yeah. afternoon flight, get to Heathrow, and then still get home without having to get up at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. to catch an early flight. I was, I was going to say, this is like, there's a whole, I think there's a whole show we could do around late European <laughs> departures to the United States, because there's certain ones that I would love to take, uh, but have never worked out for me from a pricing perspective. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm, I'm that thinking... 5.30 p.m. Frankfurt to Dallas, also very useful. That one, uh, the uh, Finnair uh, Helsinki JFK that leaves at like 5.30 or 4. Um, there's a Warsaw to Chicago and a Warsaw to JFK that both leave in the evening. Um, yeah, I mean, those are all very well-timed flights. Um that I just haven't had an opportunity to take yet. So there's not a lot. That's a that's always the weird thing. Yeah, but yeah, it's like a dozen of the hundred or two hundred you know, and fifty flights a day are the late late ones. Wasn't it's, uh, wasn't the KLM one we talked about last show too? Yeah, and, and if you pull out London, you get that number halves. 
Yeah. Wasn't there a late – I think the Lufthansa Frankfurt San Francisco was, was relatively late, right? You're thinking it, Munich. Is it Munich okay. San Francisco was late because it, it, it would get in at like 5 o'clock or something. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, which is really nice. And then it would return back to Europe in at ten at, p.m. At t- ten p.m. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the, so I don't know. The um, I really there's also like forty six J forty six business seats, twenty two premium economy, and then like what fifty or so economy seats. It's almost the same number of total seats as the JetBlue plane, which is spec for one sixty. JetBlue only has twenty four business class seats, two of which are sort of the fancy suite, and then the others are the regular. Uh, but it's super interesting to me that like United's plane is basically paid for yeah. and yeah, it'll burn more fuel, but they don't have to make payments on the plane anymore. Whereas JetBlue's got a brand new 321 LR that they've got to sort of cover costs on. It's going to be a real interesting game of does United just literally price match JetBlue and keep the fare stupid low on business class, but takes you to Heathrow instead of what will likely be Gatwick service. It sounds like one for United, right? It's just inserting another rotation in because it's the same plane that goes to Chicago, Dallas and Newark. Yeah. So, like, on the London side, you're saying they can flip the plane over yeah. to, to one of those destinations. So they don't have to because otherwise the routing doesn't make sense. Yeah, because they can then start to optimize some of the plane operations. So some of those planes sit in London overnight, right? Mm-hmm. And you really? could – yeah, I think one – I thought one, only the daytime arrivals do. I want to say at least one of – because of with the five Newark flights, I want to say at least one of them did. Interesting. To so that the early departure westbound was already on the ground? Yes. Interesting. Because remember, there's two there's two flights in the morning that leave, right? You've got the 8.30 and the 10. You've got two flights at 8.30, I think, and you've got a 10. Okay. So it might they might just be able to optimize that. Yeah. And is, isn't, is Delta running Boston Heathrow? Or, yes, or that, do, yeah. yeah. It, right. If, if everything goes to plan based on what was previously operating slash announced, you've got... BA and AA as a joint, you know, joint venture, but both operating. Delta and Virgin Atlantic joint venture, but both operating. United and JetBlue, six different airlines, potentially like ten flights a day. You're super excited about super cheap fares. I can just, I can feel it in your bones. I, I, <laughs> I'm starting to look at this and be like, I mean, it was great when we had Norwegian flying transatlantic, but now all of a sudden I might get, I might get the same cheap flights anyway. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I get the pent up demand argument, but there ain't that much pent up demand for London. But I mean, there's, there's, you know, uh, I think one of our friends was saying that uh, at least for United, they're allowing connections in Boston on some of the routing rules out of, uh, for further points west, um, out of a hub. So you might be able to, you know, that might fill some of it. And I know um, Delta pushes a fair bit of connections through Boston as well. I don't yeah. know about AA. Yeah. Well, uh, AA in theory could push some of those connections on JetBlue Metal, but not for this because of the way the. <laughs> partnership like there's that's the other part i'm still trying to figure out is how they're going to work like oh yeah connect onward and someone actually reached out to me um today asking about you know why don't these all these code share flights don't show up as connecting flights yet they're only for o and d the non-stop markets right now so like you can't connect uh jfk onward from you know if you fly in from paris the jet blue connections don't work yet and will they, and how will that happen? But at the same time, American was very clear that the only reason they're adding Athens and Tel Aviv and now Santiago and three Colombian cities is because this feed. So yeah. who the hell knows? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about our listener question. I'm going to skip top of that. That's just because we're running short on time. Uh, an anonymous listener, we're going to leave his name out. He asked for that to happen, uh, has raised some questions. So he, he just got his first dose of a vaccine, and he's really been anticipating getting on a plane again. Uh, he has two questions. Is One, is it ethical uh, to travel once I finish the vaccine regimen? The data says that he's protected, but he p- could potentially infect someone else. Uh, would you would we feel okay traveling if we had the vaccine? Um, and, uh, and the vast majority of people do not. And then question two is he's, he's been looking at which countries have requirements for entries for Americans and can't find any policy changes for people that can approve vaccination. Uh, do we know of a central site that tracks uh, what entry requirements are given at any given time? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I guess let's start with question one. Can we start with question two? Because I actually know the answer. Sure. <laughs> Tomatic um, has gotten pretty good at uh, tracking all those details. So Tomatic is run by IATA. It's the sort of database of entry requirements. And it's what the airlines all use. So when you, know, you show up at the counter and like, hi, I'm traveling to this country, and they they pull it up and they can say, oh, you need a visa or you need health insurance or you need a yellow fever vaccine or any of those things. Uh, IATA has added the field for uh, sort of COVID-related requirements. So that definitely is maybe not the perfect source, but it's one where I would start. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And the bad, the downside of Time Attic is it's generally a paid service. Um, and, you you know, as an individual user, you can't really license it from uh, IATA. The good news is that a couple airlines have sort of public interfaces to it and just suck up the cost for people to be able to use it. Um, I always use United Airlines interface to it because it's the one I've had bookmarked uh, forever. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But it's basically um, that's that's where I end up going. And that's. In it's you know they're tying it into their health passport app and all sorts of other things, but I would say your odds of getting the right answer are mixed anywhere. But that's where I'd probably feel most comfortable at least referring someone. Well, it's the same data that the airlines are going to use, so right, you at least have that going for you. Um, and so yeah, that link will be in the show notes. Uh, question one, much harder to answer. Yeah, um, is it ethical to travel? Once I've finished the vaccine regimen, I mean, we're not a, I, this isn't a philosophy podcast, uh, but <laughs> it's also not a woodworking podcast, but here we are. <laughs> uh, I would say I'm, I'm mixed on this. I, I, I think it's ethical, but you still need to show caution um, until we, until we have more data. Right. I think that's a big part of it. And I also think sort of the, where are you going to go? And, you know, I, there's two things that I always look at think about when I, you know, when I have to travel for work or when I think about what am I going to do to sort of restart travel, even talking to my parents that now have had both their shots and my dad's like, Hey, yeah, we don't think we're going to fly, but we're, th- we're going to, we're going to get in the car and we're going to drive. Um, and we'll see your, you know, my brother and sister live in Atlanta and in DC. And he's like, you know, and they can do that trip relatively soon. It's like, and maybe then from there, we'll drive up and see you guys up in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. And I would love to see my parents. I don't think them spending three days driving up here is the smartest thing to do. Um, and then it's also like, okay, but along the way, you got to spend time in hotels and dealing with restaurants and all these other things. And to me, until more people are also vaccinated, I see myself as still a risk of being a carrier, right? Even though if I may not have, you know, symptoms or be affected by it. Um, and also the sort of induced demand is the wrong word, but like creating additional stress on the system, which the good news is, right, caseloads are down now, uh, hospitalizations are down now. We It seems like things are vaguely under control, are much better than they were just a couple months ago. But until it's, you know, pretty clear that, like, we're not also unnecessarily putting extra hotel and restaurant and other workers at risk just because we want to travel, that's, that's a hard balance for me to strike. And I feel like I kind of think I want some more people to be vaccinated first. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also interesting for me because I know I'm going to be last, Mm. Like, I'll be, I certainly will fight to get up relatively quick in my group once we're open, but my group is going to be last. I'm, I'm a relatively young, healthy person. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a fair assessment. I think for me, I'm, you know, the risk on planes is like we've talked about, it's, it's not nil, but it's lower um, because everybody's wearing masks or supposed to be. Um, And, you know, but the the real key comes in with hotels, restaurants, you know, delivery drivers, if you're ordering in um, that you put them at risk. It's not that you're at risk it's that they're, they're at risk. Uh, And, and, and a lot of them will be last. So, yeah. And I mean, listen, I, I went and got takeout for dinner last night. So like, I can't say I'm never going to interact with a restaurant person along the way, but I don't, I do it once or so a week here, not every day, um, which would be the case if I'm traveling. Um, there's, and again, I think, you know, a month from now when way more people have had their first dose and a lot more people have had their second dose, my opinion might change a little. I think we'll, we're going to start seeing some of the numbers shifting. I think some States, some areas will be better than others at sort of getting it out there and having, you know, hitting that sort of critical mass level, but I don't know. It's- well, and, and I mean, from the data we're seeing about Moderna and Pfizer, right? Like the first dose, just a couple of weeks in, they're saying, you know, there's an efficacy level now that's, that's helping provide some of that herd immunity that we, we want to see. So again, if you wait a month, it, 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 numbers could really start to nosedive. Of, yeah. And of cases. If, if the listener is waiting until he gets a second shot anyways, yep. uh, it's at least a couple of weeks out. So that may, that may be enough to make it more reasonable. Exactly. Um, do I feel okay traveling if I have the vaccine? I mean, I feel safe. Like I've gotten my first dose. I'll get my second dose at the end of this month. Um, I still have to be aware of that. And so we've, we've already talked to another family who we know is, is vaccinated about maybe, you know, Hey, let's just hang out. We, we could hang out now because we know you're vaccinated and we're vaccinated and we're not going to see a lot of other people. Um, but I don't know. You just got to weigh the risk. Are you, are you going to be like at a, a, a resort somewhere by yourself? Eh, you know, maybe, maybe go for it. I, I don't know. It's, it's tough. It's a tough question. Foz, do you have any thoughts? I mean, 
I think the bigger question is, what are you going to do if you travel right now? Mm. Half the world is closed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really the big question, right? It's like you can't go to a lot of international destinations. Yeah, still. Like, you know, you're going to go. You're going to go travel somewhere to go do a takeout in a hotel room, yeah. right? And I, I don't think it's the time to do it. And you know, hopefully by the summer things get better. I mean, we've already survived eleven months into this. What's a few more? Yeah. Yep. Um, I think let's let's wrap it up on that note uh we've got a couple of interesting uh topics for after the show uh if you're a patreon subscriber you can hear us talk about thin air selling their meals in grocery stores and uh souvenirs that we would like we'd like to bring home so uh yeah if you're a patreon subscriber stick around uh if you'd like to become a patreon subscriber you can go to to, to patreon.com uh and we should thank our our new patrons uh stefan uh cena david Galen, Ben, and Kevin, thanks for thanks for joining us on Patreon. Uh, we, we appreciate your support. And uh, to our listeners, happy travels. Bye-bye. See you later. Take care.